Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. It's called Bullet with Butterfly Wings. You know, the Smashing Pumpkin song where he goes the world as a vampire and despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. That one, yeah, it's called Bullet with Butterfly Wings. I'm not entirely sure why. As far as I can find, the band has never officially explained the name, but a quick Google or a scroll through this video's comment section will give you plenty of interesting theories to choose from. I'm not really an explain the name sort of channel, though. I'm more about explaining the music and whatever you call this song, it's got some really cool music to explain. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. The world is a vampire. So I'm gonna break with tradition and look at Billy Corgan's vocals first, starting with the decision to do the first line a cappella. This gives the song a chance to make a really clear mission statement because the only thing you have to focus on is the lyrics. Bullet with Butterfly Wings is about feeling trapped and angry, and this first line sums up that feeling perfectly. The lyrics get a bit more obtuse as the verse goes on, but all of that is grounded in the simple imagery of a vampire world. When you're starting with an a cappella line, there's two main ways to do it. In my experience, the more common approach is to end the line on beat one like this. The world is a vampire with the band coming in on the last syllable as a sort of punctuation mark to end the sentence. This works well for songs that are trying to be big and boisterous, and while I actually think it sounds great here, it's not really the right vibe for the song, so instead they take the other approach, ending the line on beat four and trailing off. The world is a vampire. This separates the sentence from the rest of the song, letting the image linger for a moment before the action really begins. Note-wise, the verse has a pretty simple melody based on a common structure called a period. The standard analogy here is a question and answer. In a period, the first line ends on an unstable point, often the fifth, and then the second line has the same basic shape but resolves to a more stable point, usually the root. The period structure is a great framework for building melodies. The repeating form gives it a good, solid contour, while the different endings provide some drama and then a sense of closure. A lot of great melodies have been written using period form, but this isn't one of them. I don't mean it's not great, I mean it's not a period. Not quite. If it was, it'd sound like this. The world is a vampire. Set to drain. With a resolution at the end of the second phrase, but instead they do this. The world is a vampire. Set to drain. Resolving first and then unresolving. Instead of a question and answer, we've got an answer and then another question. This blurs the lines between phrases. The points that feel metrically complete don't feel melodically resolved, and vice versa. The whole section blends together into one long thought, with each new lyric serving as either an extension of or a response to the previous one. The secret destroyers were sent to drain. The question what do I get is in the context of being held up to the flame. With a more segmented melody, it'd be easy to read this as four unrelated images, especially because there's a full bar of rest between each of them, but the backwards period form forces us to hear it all as a single idea. Underneath the vocals, Corgan and guitarist James Eha play the song's iconic riff. <laughs> At heart, it's a pretty simple chord loop. I'd break it up into two halves. In the first, we're sort of gliding down in thirds from B flat to G flat to E flat. Once we're on E flat, we turn around and head back up, but this time with stronger, bolder chord motion, going by fourth from E flat to A flat, then by step back to B flat. If you've seen my videos on loop theory, you'll recognize this as a piston loop, kind of like a minor version of the doo op changes. If not, though, don't worry, the important part is it's got this steady rise and fall to it. You feel the B flat chord is the root, and E flat is the furthest point from it, so you're sort of drifting away from home and then marching back. It's all fairly standard chord loop behavior, but that doesn't mean it's bad. I always worry when I say something is common that it sounds like I'm saying it's lazy, but that's not true. Most songs use common techniques, that's what makes them common. What makes a particular song great isn't which things it uses, but how it uses them. Like, they could have just played the loop like this. <laughs> and harmonically it would have been the exact same thing. So why doesn't it sound half as cool? Well, there's a couple reasons. For starters, there's the voicings. What I played was just basic power chords, but the actual song uses very specific chord shapes. Throughout this section, Corgan and Eha are holding B-flat and F on the high strings and only moving the lowest note to match Darcy Retsky's bass line. As the chord descends, they stop hitting the higher strings every time, so those notes start to fade away a bit, but they're still fretting them, so if you listen closely, you can still hear them ring. As we move through the progression, these sustained notes take on increasingly complex relationships to the underlying harmony, giving it this rich, nuanced character that still feels approachable because you've already heard the notes in a more familiar context. Perhaps a more obvious difference, though, is this A-flat on beat 2. 
-hmm. Dipping down to the flat 7 is a fairly common embellishment, and it makes the line feel a bit more melodic. It turns it from a chord progression into an actual riff. That's important because this is the bar where Corgan's vocals are laying out, leaving the guitar as the lead instrument, so adding a little extra flourish keeps the song from getting stagnant. We see a similar thing in Retzky's bass line at the end of the riff, adding a passing A natural in between the A flat and B flat which really cements that sense of arrival when it starts over. But the most important part is how the rhythm plays with the shape of the loop. Again, the first half is a glide down from B flat to E flat, and the reason it's so smooth is that the G flat chord is there to mediate. It's closely connected to both of its neighbors, so it helps usher us gently from one to the other. So if hypothetically we wanted to make it feel a bit less smooth, the best way to do that would probably be to mess with that G flat chord, right? Like maybe we could encroach on its territory. What if we, I don't know, held the B flat for an extra eighth note? Nice, sounding less stable already, but let's really push it. Let's chop an eighth note off the end as well and bring the E flat in early. Perfect. We still have the same weak harmonic motion, but the connective tissue of our walkdown is being squeezed on both sides. The whole thing feels really tenuous, like it's grasping at stability, but not quite making it. This also pushes the chord transitions onto the offbeats, which is just a way more attention-grabbing place to change chords. The added syncopation makes what could easily have been a fairly boring progression way more exciting. Honestly though, to me, the star of this verse isn't the guitar or the vocals, it's Jimmy Chamberlain's drums. Check him out and see if you notice anything missing. Yeah, there's no snare. There's no cymbal either, no hi-hat, no high-end percussion of any kind. It's all kicks and toms giving it this deep rumbling effect like an earthquake. If I add a snare... It sucks the life out of it. It may be the more traditional approach, but it just doesn't feel right here. It loses the weight that Chamberlain's actual part has. We'll start to hear some snares later on, and when we do, I want you to pay really close attention to what it's doing, because I'm pretty sure the snare is the key to understanding the emotional arc of this song. In fact, let's stick with the drums as we move into the pre-chorus. Here we do finally get some snares, but not on the backbeat like we'd expect. Instead, Chamberlain uses it to accent the vocal pattern. Up to now, Corgan's phrasing has been pretty natural, almost spoken, but here it becomes more artificial, with long gaps between syllables and an emphasis on the offbeats. This pattern is also mirrored in the guitars, where every time the snare hits, the chord changes. Well, every time except the last one, but whatever, you know what I mean. I know I'm bouncing around a lot between instruments here, but really, that's the point. I don't think this pre-chorus is best understood by looking at different parts in isolation. I think more than any specific instrument, this section is defined by the underlying rhythmic pattern they all share. So let's talk about that pattern. So far I've been starting it on beat one, but if we listen to the vocals, that's pretty clearly wrong. It actually starts with a pickup on beat three. <laughs> Much better. Okay, so what's going on? Well, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind when I look at this is a clave. I made a video about these, link in the description, but basically a clave is a kind of rhythm used in Afro-Cuban music that shows up in a bunch of other genres too, including rock. There's a couple different kinds of claves with slightly different patterns, but for now let's compare it to the one you're probably most familiar with, the son clave. In rock, it's usually played like this. which is called a 3-2 clave because the first bar has three beats and the second bar has two, but traditional Cuban music tends to prefer the 2-3 clave like this. If we compare that to our pre-chorus rhythm, we see three of the attacks already line up, but we can do better. Another common clave is the rumba clave, which is the same thing, but it pushes this last note back. The rumba clave isn't all that common in rock, but it does match four of our five attacks. The only difference is that this quarter note at the start has been moved from beat two to beat four, or maybe a better way to think about it is these two attacks have both been pushed back a quarter note. This change, though, makes it not really feel like a clave anymore. To my ears, a key part of the clave sound is the separate groups of two and three beats, but here they get smushed together so it sounds more like one rhythmic phrase and then a long pause. So is this a clave? Eh, no, but I wanted to mention it because I think it's worth acknowledging that when you're analyzing music, not every pattern you find actually means anything. As a theorist, I saw this rhythm and thought clave, but as a listener, it's not really there. While it's tempting to try to bend over backwards justifying the comparison, at a certain point the argument gets so tenuous that you just have to let go. But that doesn't mean this digression was pointless. Thinking about why it's not there helped me better understand what the rhythm is doing. Much like a clave, I'd break this up into two parts. There's the lead-in, 
which is just on-beat quarter notes matching Corgan's natural phrasing from the verse, and then there's the payoff, no. which is the more rigid part spacing the notes out and hitting them on offbeats. The push and pull of rhythmic intrigue is something it shares with the clave, even if that particular label doesn't really apply. But what about the harmony? It's the same four chords as the verse, but they've swapped the middle two, so instead of gliding from B-flat to G-flat to E-flat, we're just jumping straight down. This fundamentally changes the shape of the loop because it moves the destination. A loop's destination is the chord it wants to collapse to. In the verse, this was B-flat. We leave it by weak motion, then return to it by strong motion, making it our primary point of harmonic arrival. In the pre-chorus, though, the only chord we really land on like that is the E-flat. Now, I'm not saying that's the root. We're still in B-flat. The melody makes that very clear. E but the E-flat is the center of our harmonic weight. It's also the second chord in the loop, which, metrically speaking, is the weakest point, and burying our destination there makes the whole thing feel off-balance. It wants to go somewhere else. That instability is further emphasized by the syncopation. Instead of holding the B-flat chord for an extra eighth like in the verse, here it gets cut off an eighth note early, so we're only on the one chord for a beat and a half. It's the same chords, but the balance of power between them has changed. The last bar of the pre-chorus drops the E-flat chord so it can spend more time on A-flat, before switching on the distortion to set up the chorus. Adding a new sound in the last couple beats of the pre-chorus is a classic build-up technique to get you excited for the climax we're about to hit. Once we're in the chorus, the first place I want to look is, again, the drums. And hey, we've got a backbeat. Normally that wouldn't be particularly noteworthy, but given how long we've gone without one, this feels like a statement. The song is about feeling trapped, and the verses have this sort of calm, muted aggression to them, but here Corgan is smashing himself against the bars of his cage, and the switch to a more recognizable hard rock groove makes it feel all that much more violent. As for the guitars... This feels to me like they're trying to start a four chord loop and failing. Specifically, they're trying to play the minor axis progression, one of the most common loops in modern music, which they spell out in these first two bars, but instead of actually looping it, they interrupt it with this. So if they don't actually loop it, why does it still feel like a loop? Well, for starters, the phrase is three bars long. Most rock songs do their rhythms in groups of two or four, so this three bar pattern is inherently uneven. The most natural way to process it is as two main bars and then an extra one. The third bar is also noticeably different in its arrangement. The first two just play the chords like normal for about two beats each, but the third one has a specific rhythmic figure, reintroducing the syncopation from the verse. <laughs> This figure is mirrored in all the various parts, too. Retsky does this cool octave jump. Chamberlain switches from his nice steady backbeat to play some fills on his now present snare. And Corgan, well, Corgan lays out because this bar isn't a part of his story. Harmonically, it also breaks the shape of the loop. In the minor axis progression, B-flat is supposed to be our destination, but instead of resolving there, the A-flat gets pulled away to E-flat, after which we get G-flat and then finally B-flat, all of which is weak third-based motion. The B-flat no longer gets resolved to, so instead of a triumphant return, we're just sort of stumbling back home, implying we got lost somewhere along the way. It's a really interesting musical metaphor for his struggle to break free. The loop represents escape, but it keeps running into a wall and having to start over because in his own words, he's still just a rat in a cage. Keep this figure in mind, it's gonna pay off later. At the end of the chorus, we finally get our fourth bar, which is super cool. They're playing what's called a sequence where you take a thing you just played and move it up or down in pitch. In this case, we're taking that interrupting third bar and playing it again a whole step higher. This rounds out the progression rhythmically, and it also fills the gap in our loop structure, bringing us back to the A-flat we were supposed to end on in the first place. It's a satisfying conclusion, but no, this isn't the payoff I was talking about. You'll have to wait a bit longer for that. Anyway, from there they just let the A-flat chord hang for two full bars to really dissipate any remaining energy from the chorus. During this, Chamberlain drops the snare, before bringing it back for one final hurrah under Corgan's vocal pickup, now I'm naked. like a send-off to the chorus's rebellious spirit, one last stab before we resign back to the verse. The second verse is mostly the same, with some added guitar lines to keep the arrangement interesting, but I do want to talk about the way Corgan uses his voice here. In the first verse, he was mostly singing in his lower register, the world is a vampire, but in the second, he jumps between octaves, seemingly at random. Nothing but an animal. 
but can you fake it? Now, every singer is going to sound different in different registers, that's just how the human voice works, but Corgan takes that to the extreme, almost like he's two different people. His delivery in the lower register sounds bitter and sarcastic, while the upper register sounds earnest and desperate. We did see this high voice for one line in the first verse. Betray desires! But here he does it on half the lines. He's pleading to be let out of his cage. From there we go pre-chorus, chorus, and then the interlude. <laughs> This sounds really wild, but it's actually just an extension of that sequence thing we talked about earlier. The second bar is the F A flat figure from the end of the first chorus, and this one is just the same thing up another whole step. So why does it sound so much weirder this time? Because it's a chromatic sequence. That is, we kept all the intervals the same, even if that meant we wound up outside the key. Going from E flat, G flat to F A flat didn't cause problems because there the motion is the same anyway, but in order to keep this minor third thing going, we had to use G natural, which is very much not in the key of B flat minor. The chorus prominently features a G flat chord, so hitting a G chord on beat one of the first bar in the strongest metric position in the phrase is a huge violation violation of our sense of tonality. And that violation is emphasized by the high guitar line. If we treat this as its own melody, it's doing this, <laughs> leaning on the root and then alternating between the major sixth and the minor third, accenting the fact that these two notes really don't play nice together and building a beautiful pile of dissonance. As for the snare, <laughs> It's everywhere. If we follow the metaphor from earlier where the snare marks our spot on a spectrum from hopelessness to rage, these constant 16th note fills mean we've broken the scale. We've reached our highest level of intensity, the musical equivalent of punching the walls of a jail cell trying to get out. This settles down a bit in the bridge where the backbeat is more recognizable. There's still a couple extra stabs though, so our rage meter is still running pretty high. Harmonically, We're back to the original sequence with all the chords fitting comfortably in B flat minor, but they're not actually playing any B flat chords. We've lost our root. Now, we haven't changed keys. The melody is still pretty clearly B flat pentatonic. Tell me I'm the only one. But that's contrasted with a chord loop that keeps setting up a resolution that it never delivers. It's like a barber's pole of musical tension. It's ramping up and up without ever releasing. If we remove the B flat melody, this could be a pretty stable progression, but with it, we have this constant pull in a direction we're not allowed to go. Eventually though, we do get that release with the breakdown. Despite all my rage, I am still just rat in a cage. Which is just the chorus played at a much lower dynamic. It's just guitar and vocals, Corgan singing in his lower register, and the distortion is off. Whereas the previous choruses were focused on his impotent rage, this is acceptance, or at least surrender. It's telling the other side of the lyrical story. He's still just a rat in a cage, and he always will be. He's stuck, and he's coming to terms with that. Despite all my rage, I am still just a rat in a cage. Or not. Okay, so obviously this chorus is one final rage against the dying of the light, but here's the surprising thing. It works. He breaks free. How do I know that? Well, remember how I said the chorus used that interrupting loop thing to represent the walls of the cage holding him back? Well, check out the guitar part in this final chorus and see if you notice anything different. <laughs> Yeah, no interruption. For about 45 seconds, they successfully play the loop. It's a dark and hollow freedom built out of rage and spite, but it's freedom nonetheless. Still though, it's not all smiles and rainbows. Let's check the snare one last time. For most of the section, it's just playing the backbeat, but near the end, when Corgan starts singing I Still Believe That I Cannot Be Saved, it does this becoming a metronome and hitting on every beat. This new marching pattern, combined with the lyrics, paints a bleak picture. He's broken free, but he doesn't believe it. In his mind, he's still flailing against the cage he was trapped in. Even though he's out, he can't put that rage behind him, and in the end... <laughs> He winds up right back in. They try to do the sequence, but they can't even find the A flat. There was a light at the end of the tunnel, but he couldn't push past his anger and find his way out. It's a dark reading of a dark song, but that's smashing pumpkins for ya. To me, Bullet with Butterfly Wings is a warning against letting your anger define you, because in the end, you wind up trapped inside your own rage. On that note, Thanks for watching. As always, this song was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.